Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 162. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Prelates such as Archbishop Salvatore Corleone of San Francisco, Bishop George Thomas of Las Vegas, and Bishop James Connolly of Lincoln are three bishops American Catholics are holding up as stellar members of the hierarchy because they've taken a stand against allowing pro-abortion politicians from receiving communion. But have they really? No, they haven't. They're actually the worst sort of cowards there is. And we're going to look at that in this week's episode. Something special I'm trying to do for you is build a membership area on my website. That area will have loads of video and audio courses you can take at your convenience. There's just one problem, and someone listening can help me out with that problem. I had to purchase a high-end software to develop the members area. But now that I reach an estimated 300,000 souls each week, host weekly webinars, write for three Catholic media platforms, produce weekly bulletin inserts, and other things, I simply don't have the time to learn this new software. If anyone listening is tech-savvy or has worked with Lifter LMS, and if you're willing to donate your time to help, I really need you to build out this membership area for me. If you can help, just reach out to me at joe at cantankerouscatholic.com. It's in my show notes. First, I want to give a shout out to my listeners in Japan, who I presume are American service people stationed there. Out of the more than one million podcasts they could be listening to, they've made the Cantankerous Catholic 214 in Japan. That's quite an accomplishment and I thank you for it. I'm a veteran of the United States Army. I joined the Army for two reasons, because I love this country and because I knew I'd go in a boy and come out a man. 
I learned a lot about courage, honor, human dignity, pride, and loyalty. Consequently, the three human characteristics I most admire and respect are courage, honor, and loyalty. On the reverse side, the characteristics I most loathe are cowardice and betrayal, noting that those two characteristics by their nature include dishonor. In November in Baltimore, the USCCB moved forward with its long-awaited document on Eucharistic coherence. Catholics all across the country were hoping and praying that the document would finally invoke Canon 915 and put an end to Catholic pro-abort politicians from receiving communion. But our Judas-like bishops once again betrayed Christ and the Catholic laity in this country. All they did was to issue a document about the Eucharist with information we already knew, and instead listened to Pope Marxist, who said, Communion is not a prize for the perfect. Communion is a gift, the presence of Jesus and his church. Faithful Catholics in America were once again disappointed by our hierarchy. Consequently, there was an incredible amount of blowback, and the weaker of the Judases among them felt the need to do something. The first act was Archbishop Corleone. He's being held up by many of the laity as a man of great courage, a man who's seen as bucking his brother sociopaths with croziers. First, he revealed that he had not taken the jab for COVID, making the laity believe he's a real maverick. Then he asked the laity to pray for the conversion of Nancy Pelosi and stated publicly that Catholic politicians who supported abortion should avoid presenting themselves for communion, making the laity think he was a stallion in the mitered horse herd, when he's really just a broken-down gelding in a corral of mitered horse dung. Everything he's done is merely smoke and mirrors, because he only suggested that these pro-abort politicians not receive communion. He hasn't actually forbidden Pelosi or any other abortion supporter in his archdiocese. He's a coward. He hasn't the courage to stop the sacrilege being perpetrated against the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the God he's sworn to defend with his life. Then there's Bishop Thomas of Las Vegas. He said, quote, If a politician from the Diocese of Las Vegas finds himself or herself at odds with the Church's teaching on the sacredness of human life, I ask him or her to voluntarily refrain from reception of Holy Communion while holding public office. End quote. He asked them to voluntarily refrain from communion. That's like asking a street corner drug dealer to voluntarily refrain from selling drugs. It ain't going to happen. Then Bishop Thomas further exposed his cowardice when he said, I place the onus of that decision upon the individual politician's shoulders and not on the backs of pastors or Eucharistic ministers. The onus is on you, Your Excellency. The polls won't accept that onus, and certainly priests and extraordinary lay ministers of the Holy Eucharist should deny communion to those who publicly support abortion, but they won't. The reason they won't, Excellency, is because they know you don't have their backs. If you had their backs, you would have invoked Canon 915 against these politicians to let everyone know you're serious about protecting the very Jesus Christ in his Eucharistic form you've sworn your life to protect. But since you asked the Poles to refrain from communion voluntarily, the priests know that if they deny communion to those Poles, that it'll come back to bite them on their fifth point of contact. You coward! Why can't you take the heat instead of sacrificing your priests or expecting these Poles to do what's right? They're already doing wrong because they promote abortion. You're the worst sort of coward because your lack of commitment that throws the sole responsibility on the Poles and expecting priests to follow up is like a terrorist holding a child in front of him as a shield from bullets being shot at him. A fellow coward bishop is Bishop James Connolly of Lincoln, Nebraska. He was impressed with your act of cowardice and told us so when he said, I commend Bishop Thomas on his courageous stance, end quote. 
Apparently, Bishop Connolly is another bishop who thinks terrorists are justified using a child as human shield. The only member of the USCCB I know of who actually took a stand several years ago and invoked Canon 915 against pro-abort politicians is Bishop Thomas Paprocki of Springfield, Illinois. Lots of bishops have made statements that pro-aborts need to refrain from communion, but only Bishop Pap Rocky has done what needed to be done. Little Dickie Durbin, the Illinois senator, knows he's not welcome to receive communion in Springfield. Of course, Little Dickie simply stated that he'd perform his sacrilege elsewhere. And that's more than shameful. Not because Little Dickie is going elsewhere to perform the sacrilege, after all, we expect demonic dim worshippers of Moloch to continue doing their thing as long as they can. What's shameful is that little Dickie can actually go somewhere else. Why isn't every bishop in the nation backing Bishop Paprocki? Of course, we know why. The vast majority of our bishops either have no supernatural faith, they don't believe, and the rest don't have the guts to do the job they've sworn their lives to do. What is the canon that Bishop Paprocki invoked that no other bishop is willing to use? Canon 915 reads, Those upon whom the penalty of excommunication or interdict has been imposed or declared, and others who obstinately persist in manifest grave sin, are not to be admitted to Holy Communion, end quote. Notice that this canon doesn't say those who obstinately persist in manifest grave sin are to voluntarily refrain from communion, but that they are not to be admitted to Holy Communion at all. Period. End of sentence. Although politics is certainly involved here, because we're talking about politicians who support the slaughter of innocent babies, American citizens sent to death absence of crime, due process of law, and conviction, this isn't a political issue, not for Catholics anyway. Three weeks ago, I proved to you, even you theologically thick Catholics, that Jesus is really and truly present in the Most Holy Eucharist. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, in the Eucharist, Christ gives us the very body he gave up on the cross, the very blood which he poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, end quote. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven through 29, Paul writes, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, meaning in a state of mortal sin, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, if the Eucharist is a mere symbol or representation of Jesus, how in the world can you eat judgment on yourself by receiving communion while in a state of mortal sin? And this was reiterated by every church father from the very first century and has been taught by the Catholic Church for 2,000 years. No, this isn't a political issue, but rather a spiritual issue. Our Lavender Mafia bishops of the criminal empire known as the USCCB is voluntarily subjecting Jesus Christ to the worst sort of indignities. It's sacrilege. We shouldn't be surprised about that, though. Let me remind you that two weeks ago, Michael Voris told you on this show that he overheard one bishop say to another bishop in Baltimore, quit talking about the deposit of the faith. There is no deposit of faith. We don't believe. Jesus tells us quite clearly what he intends to do about these bishops in Revelation 21.8 when he said, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is a second death. Every single bishop in the USCCB fits into at least one of the eight categories of evil that Jesus mentions in this passage. 
The only one of these not fitting any bishop that I'm personally aware of is saucers. However, the USCCB is full of cowardly, faithless, murdering, sexually perverted, idolatrous, and lying men. Even my own archbishop is guilty of murder by covering up a murder for another bishop. These are evil men, evil men who beg for your money to finance their criminal activities. Look, we have to respect the office of the Episcopate, but we don't have to respect the men occupying those offices when they do absolutely nothing to earn our respect and trust. To respect and not fight them is to be complicit in their evil. Like it or not, Jesus will hold that complicity against you at your judgment. And trust me, these evil men won't be there to defend you. Even if they could, they wouldn't. They won't defend the faith or the faithful now, so it would be feckless to expect them to do it then. We have to fight, six-pack warriors. We have to give them so much trouble, public humiliation, and embarrassment that they'll be forced to step down and or repent and become transparent. Therefore, I'm going to propose the boldest move ever proposed. Church Militant has resistance groups in almost every diocese in the country. You should join or start one if you're not already a member. Then I propose that those resistance groups do whatever is necessary to fund and hire competent private investigators to investigate all aspects of their bishops' lives and function in their offices then publicly expose the things uncovered by those investigators, no matter how embarrassing it is to the bishop or the church. Jesus can defend his church, so don't worry about embarrassing her. As for the bishops, on the other hand, this is beyond a doubt the best way to get them, because cockroaches can't stand the light of discovery. Let's begin a conversation about this to see how you think about this proposal. At the bottom of the page that contains my show notes is a place where you can comment. Let's begin the discussion there. I'll personally answer questions and interact with you on the discussion. Remember, six-pack warriors, comfort and conviction don't live on the same block. You probably won't believe this, but I had a priest tell me the other day that it's better to leave the laity in their ignorance of Catholic teaching so they can have a better chance at going to heaven. What? The Catholic Church clearly teaches that a Catholic's ignorance of the faith is an evil, a privation, that the human mind created in God's image is made to know truth. I can't judge the state of this priest's soul, but I can judge what he told me. What he said implies that he really doesn't care about the souls of his parishioners. Fortunately, I can know that faithful priests aren't that way. Jesus established the Catholic Church for one reason and one reason only, so we'd have a chance to go to heaven, a chance to become saints. As I heard a local priest say in a homily a while back, if you don't want to become a saint, why on earth are you a Catholic? Since at least 95% of Catholics neither know nor understand the Catholic faith, a chance to become a saint isn't possible for them. Conscientious priests and devoted laity naturally want to help parishioners do that. Well, I can help you with that. Introducing the What We Believe, Why We Believe It bulletin inserts. Endorsed by Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke, each of these inserts teaches a thumbnail catechism lesson. When parishioners begin to get involved, they'll get many more benefits besides, and at a cost of only $19.95 a month. But you won't start out paying that, because I want to give you a three-month subscription free of charge just to try it out. Take 11 minutes to watch the video fully explaining it by clicking the link in my show notes that says, Six Pack System Bulletin Inserts to learn more. A lot of lay people get a subscription for their parish as a way to support the parish without giving the bishop any of their money. To learn more, click on the link in my show notes that says Six Pack System Bulletin Inserts. It just requires 11 minutes of your time. Joe Six Pack 
The Every Catholic Guy wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to Fox News. The fundraising platform GoFundMe reversed the decision to redistribute money given by thousands of donors to the Canadian Freedom Convoy protesting COVID-19 regulations. GoFundMe froze the convoy's official campaign on Friday, claiming the convoy was violent and unlawful. At first, GoFundMe asked donors to submit refund forms and promised to donate to charities any money not properly returned. Hours later, GoFundMe walked back the refund applications and promised to refund all donors automatically. Their change of course came after Governor Ron DeSantis threatened to investigate the company for fraud. Woohoo! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic news, news pick, pick number four. Hats off to Yahoo News. Arlington Circuit Court Judge Louise de Matteo of Virginia on Friday temporarily halted an executive order by Governor Glenn Youngkin that allowed parents to opt out of school mask mandates for their children. Keeping rules in place that have been established over the school year helps children, families, and staff understand how they may be impacted during the pandemic, Judge de Matteo wrote. She ruled in favor of seven boards that filed a lawsuit challenging the governor's order. Why, you no good, stinking, rotten rascal! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic news, news pick, pick number three. three. Hats off to the Chicago City Wire. A court ruling nullified Democratic Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzner's draconian mask requirement for school children, but the Archdiocese of Chicago said it would ignore the ruling and continue to force kids to wear a mask. Catholic vote Brian Birch responded, The science is clear. Continued masking of children poses real and substantial risk to the development of children. They are abusing and assaulting their students with these policies. Consider for a second that there are five- and six-year-old children that have never seen the face of their teacher, ever. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic news, news pick, pick number two. two. Hats off to the Washington Examiner. Some are calling for pretender Joe Biden to make major staffing changes. One prominent target is White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain. As critics say, he has steered the administration into an ever-leftward position and a number of unforced errors. Even some Democrats have complained that Klain is pushing Biden too far to the left and undercutting his plans to be a centrist president who works across the aisle, the Washington Examiner reports. These criticisms come as the Biden administration continues to suffer low public approval ratings and frequent setbacks in Congress. Hmm, okay. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic news pick number one. Hats off to MSN. Senator Joe Manchin predicted that Congress will pass legislation that addresses and clarifies the role of Congress and the vice president in the certification of a presidential election. Manchin pointed to flaws in how the 1887 Electoral Count Act was written, which some supporters of Donald Trump cited in January 2021. Manchin said, they thought there was a kind of ambiguity, if you will, and there was an avenue they could go through and maybe overturn the election. Because there was. It was not clear. This is what we're going to fix. Like Congress can fix anything. Stop your belly aching. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. I am hard, but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack. 
the Every Catholic Guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. The Jesuits used to be known as the Pope's army because they'd go anywhere the Holy Father asked them to, no matter how dangerous or how difficult the mission territory could be. In 1618, on the island of Omura near Japan, sat a miserable thatched hut about 20 feet long and 14 feet wide, in which Jesuit Father Spaniola and 32 of his companions were imprisoned for the faith. The indignities and pain they suffered are hard to imagine. There was only one tiny window in the hut, and it was through that window that they received their food. There was so little floor space that it was impossible for them to ever lie down. They were never allowed to leave the hut under any circumstances, which means they even had to relieve themselves there, so the hut was filthy and full of stench. The weather also brought great suffering, as there was neither fire for warmth nor protection from inclement weather. They were never allowed to bathe or have clean clothes, so they eventually became infested with lice and scabies and had sores covering their bodies. They never ceased to suffer from the torture of hunger. Every day all they received for food was two little spoonfuls of cold rice cooked in water, a cup of some bitter liquid, and a little salad. Their greatest luxury was a piece of moldy black bread. For four years they languished in this little birdcage under these horrible conditions, but God didn't neglect his holy servants. The local Christians smuggled into them hosts, wine, candles, and everything they needed to celebrate the Holy Sacrifice in the Mass. Father Spaniola would say Mass every day and drew his strength, cheerfulness, courage, and perseverance from the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. After his release, in a letter to his superior, he wrote, The bread of Holy Communion gives new strength to the soul and body. This heavenly wine inflames my heart so much that I not only regard all my former sufferings as light and easy, but would willingly suffer far greater pains and offer up my life a thousand times for him who gives himself to me with so much love and generosity in this holy sacrament. At first glance of this story, we see only the suffering of a priest of the living God and his companions. At least that's what we see through our natural eyes. However, if you learn to look at this story, indeed all events surrounding us, through spiritually sensitive eyes, there's far more going on here than mere suffering. Viewing this through our natural eyes, we wonder how people can endure such suffering and still have the ability to write what Father Spaniola did to his superior. But the perspective given through spiritually sensitive eyes tells us the whole story. All seven of the sacraments have sacramental graces, that is, actual graces specific to a particular sacrament. There's an obvious abundance of sacramental graces being given by God and accepted by Father Spignola from five of the seven sacraments. The sacraments of baptism led Father Spaniola to the priesthood in the first place, and they gave him the desire and willingness to go to Japan and spread the gospel. The sacramental graces of confirmation gave him the courage to remain steadfast in his faith under the immense suffering from the persecution he was exposed to. The sacramental graces of holy orders enabled him to stay true to his priesthood, encourage his companions, be able to state his willingness to suffer even more for Christ, and to be able to risk life and limb for that greatest of all sacraments, the Holy Eucharist. Finally, it was the sacramental graces of the Holy Eucharist that enabled Father Spaniola to say that he would willingly suffer far greater pains and offer his life a thousand times over for him who gives himself to us with so much love and generosity in this holy sacrament. 
Most of us, no matter how hard we may try, can't seem to make it through a single day without failing our Lord by the commission of sin, mortal or venial. I can't speak for you because only God knows the state of your soul, but I know that's true for me, so I'm guessing it's true for you. Personally, over the years, our good God has given me a horror for mortal sin, and I really can't remember the last time I committed one, but I sin nonetheless every single day. Fact is, I see myself as the worst Catholic I know, so I still offend God every day. Despite that I fail God daily, my willingness to try anew each day comes from following the example Jesus gives us from the stations of the cross. Jesus carried the sins of the world on his shoulders in the form of the cross, just as we carry our own sins on our shoulders. During his death march to Calvary, Jesus fell under the weight of those sins three times. Each time he fell, he got right back up again to move forward to accomplish what the Father intended for him to accomplish. Each time we fall by commission of sin, we must also follow his example and get back up and move forward. That's not always easy, though, because it can become disheartening to know that you fall daily, sometimes multiple times each day. But there are many ways we can make falling less frequent and getting back up easier. The focus today is on one of those many means God gives us, sacramental graces. Assuming you are Catholic, and at least 99% of listeners are, you've received the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. Most of you were baptized as an infant, so you don't remember it, but you have no doubt witnessed at least a few baptisms that should make you think of your own. And your confirmation, if you're like most young people, was forgotten soon after receiving the sacrament and all the trappings that traditionally come with it. And unfortunately, many of us receive communion without really thinking about it, thus taking it for granted. But God hasn't forgotten your reception of any of those sacraments, and he continues to provide you with the graces specific to each of them. You see, the sacraments aren't mere rites that church rules say we have to receive. The sacraments are divinely instituted means of grace that allow us to be able to obtain eternity in heaven. The sacramental grace of baptism gives you all you need to avoid sin. The sacramental grace of confirmation gives you the courage to accept your baptismal graces and avoid sin by standing up to do the right thing, even when it's difficult to do so. The sacramental grace of the Holy Eucharist enables you to love God so much that you'd be willing to suffer any humiliation or torment to avoid offending Him, which is why it's a great thing for you to receive communion every day if you're able to do so. God bombards us with these graces every waking moment of the day. It's up to us to be attuned to them. So if you make it a habit to ask God every day to make you aware of those sacramental graces, you'll find it much easier to recognize and respond to them when they come. Once I got into the habit of daily asking him to make me aware of them, I then found myself asking for them often throughout the day, which makes avoiding sin much easier. So will you. There are a number of other means God provides for us to live out our reason for existence, which is to know him, love him, and serve him in this life so we can be forever happy with him in the next, and we'll be looking at those from time to time. But for now, you'd do your soul well to focus on the wonderful and infinite gifts of the sacramental graces he offers all day, every day, 24-7. As you know, I don't like asking for your financial support. I always want a win-win situation whenever possible. Well, I've got a way for you to help this apostolate without you having to do anything you're not already doing. Everybody shops on Amazon. I've developed an affiliate relationship with Amazon. When you visit cantankerouscatholic.com and click on the episodes page, blog page, or about the show page, on the right-hand side of the page you'll see Amazon ads for Catholic books and merchandise. 
There's no price difference from Amazon's site, but if you click on something you're interested in and buy it, Amazon will pay me a small commission just for you clicking on that ad. It doesn't stop there either. Anytime you're on Amazon and find things you want to buy, send me the link to the items and I'll send you another link to click when you're ready to buy. You won't pay a dime more for the item, but Amazon will pay me a commission. That way you can help to financially support this apostolate just by doing what you were going to do anyway. Remember, visit the episodes, blog, and about the show pages to find Catholic books and merchandise, and send me links to other things you want to buy on Amazon, and I'll send you the links that will pay this apostolate a small commission. And I thank you in advance for your support. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from Gottfried Daniels. He said, Rome should sometimes intervene and say this or that is not in conformity with the Catholic faith. Theologians should understand that. Some theologians go too far, for example, reducing the Catholic faith to a universal philosophy. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. In the gutters outside of Sun Wei, a prosperous Chinese city before the communist takeover, a missionary priest found a Chinese mother dressed in burlap bags. Are you a beggar, he asked. Worse than a beggar, a leper, she replied. She told how she'd been a lady of wealth with a good husband and children that she'd discovered the leprosy to save face of her family left home. Spending all her money in search of a cure but failing, she returned to her native village to beg. Her husband passed her by. He tossed her a penny but didn't recognize her. Her daughter passed, not even dropping a coin. The village elders drove her away. Eventually, she arrived outside of Sun Wei with her filthy blanket for the cold nights in the streets with her chopsticks and rice bowl that hadn't been filled for three days. Come to our colony and we'll gladly take care of you, said the priest. But I'm too weak to walk, she replied. The young American priest stooped over, picked her up, placed her rotting form on his shoulders, and carried her to his leper asylum. The priest was obeying the fifth commandment perfectly. He took care of his own spiritual well-being by becoming a priest. Now as a missionary, he gave food, shelter, and medicine to this poor leper. Later, he'd take care of the well-being of her soul as well. God's blessed you abundantly in body and soul. Be generous in helping others who aren't as fortunate as you are. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It. 